folks, welcome back to Baltimore with the 94th Annual Convention of Alpha by Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, certainly glad to be here. Many of us, many of us were aware uh, of her during the Freddie Gray case. Uh, she's a state's attorney here in Baltimore. Uh, then when she announced the prosecution of several police officers involved in his death, uh, that story, of course, went national. As a result of that, Baltimore police have not been too happy with her because she dared hold them accountable. We're seeing the exact same thing happen in other cities uh, where we have uh, district attorneys uh, who ch choose not to uh, be in bed with police, but who say, everyone should be held uh, appropriately under the law. Same standard. Uh, but she also has been focused on reducing crime in the city and not just through, through locking folks up and throwing them in jail. We're happy to have back on TV One's News One Now. Joining us, Marilyn Mosby, state's attorney here in Baltimore. Y'all can clap for her. Y'all go ahead. <laughs> So, Marilyn, good to see you. First and foremost, um, DAs have a job to do. The law is the law, whether it's a private citizen, whether it's a politician, whether it's a police officer. Uh, and, and you've been under this vicious assault from police officers because you dare say it, I'm holding you accountable for the law. You've been, they've been, they're suing you. How has it been for you dealing with that constant pressure and attack from police in this city? So what I can say is that at the end of the day, I understand and I, that it's bigger than me. Um, and that's what keeps me grounded. When I look at prosecutors and the role that prosecutors play in the criminal justice system, um, you know, we decide who's going to be charged, what sentence recommendations we're going to make. Um, it's an extremely important role. And when we consider the fact that 95% of the prosecutors in this country are white and 79% are white men, as a woman of color, I represent 1% of all elected prosecutors in the country, which is completely unacceptable. When we look at the criminal justice system, it has a disproportionate impact on communities of color. And so what has kept me grounded is that it's bigger than Marilyn Mosby, right? It's what I represent. And so I'm okay with it. And you know, that accountability led to exposure. We had the Department of Justice report that came in um, and exposed the discriminatory policing practices of one of the largest agencies in the country. Um, that exposure ultimately led to reform. So what keeps me grounded is that I'm going to do my job no matter what, and I wouldn't do anything differently. And when we talk about the issue of accountability, when we talk about uh, a police, you mentioned DOJ, uh, it, it also is incumbent upon police departments to understand this is not a one-way street. No. This is not, oh, everyone else needs to change, we're all good. There has to be a level of accountability uh, on their side as well for the public to trust that we're in this thing together. Absolutely. I mean, we have to be able to break down those barriers of distrust. Um, and that's something that I've been adamant about doing since the start of my administration. It's been two years and, and seven months. It feels like 27 and a half years, but, <laughs> you know, it, it was well worth it. You know, justice is always worth the price paid for its pursuit. Well, speaking of 27 and a half years, that's what many people say it feels like having this president. Uh, and um, <laughs> you're talking about Mr. Law and Order in terms of uh, talking about um, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, mm -hmm. uh, of course, telling prosecutors, let's go back uh, to just, uh, you know, going to the harshest sentences possible. When you hear that as a DA, when you hear the Attorney General of the United States uh, tell law enforcement we're going to pull back on consent decrees because it's affecting the morale of police, how does it make you feel? It's disheartening. Um, you know, I went into this to reform the criminal justice system, understanding that it has a disproportionate impact on communities of color. When we look at the result of mass incarceration and how we've, for a long time, criminalized folks for, um, you know, addiction problems and how that has had a disproportionate impact on our, our communities to tout regression as making America great again, it's really scary. But at the same time, what we need to understand is that that progressive reform, this is the one time that we need to appreciate states' rights and the word federalism, right? We, we, it needs to be reversed. Usually it's Republicans that feel that way. Oh, it yeah, now no. needs to be Democrats that feel that way. The only sort of reform that's going to come is going to come on a local and state level. Questions from the panel. I'll start with Jeff. 
question you want me to ask. Yeah. So, so I, I guess my concern is this. So the, the, there has been kind of, it's always a, a, a laissez-faire kind of reaction with local elections. And, and I hear us as a community constantly talk about how much we care about police reform, mm -hmm. how much we care about what's happening, mm -hmm. but there's single digits in certain cities in electing mayors um, who are in, in large part responsible for setting the tone of departments by selecting chiefs. What, what's kind of the, the, the approach we need to take from a community perspective in looking at municipal races and how those municipal races affect that local reform that you I talked mean, about? I mean, these municipal politics is local, and these municipal races have an impact on your daily lives. And so it's extremely important for us to understand the urgency of now, right? We're not going to get any sort of federal reform under this administration. And that's the reality of the situation, whether it's criminal justice reform, immigration reform, health care reform. None of that is going to come on a federal level. And so we have to understand the importance of the local politics and ensuring that our local politicians are being held accountable. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the perception divide? As you know, I live here in Baltimore, and on one side of town, the more affluent, the more white side of town, uh, they had a different reaction to the Freddie Gray prosecutions than the African-American you know, side of town, if you will, quote unquote. And there literally are sides of towns in Baltimore, uh, believe it or not, in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. The size of uh, town in America. Yeah. So, <laughs> I was going to say, it's not just and, Baltimore. That's America. And so the question for me is, is how are you navigating uh, these two worlds here in Baltimore? And, and what do you think that it means for your reelection prospects? So what I can say is I'm going to do what's right. I mean, that's, that's my job. That's what I'm tasked with doing. And I think, you know, at first everybody was upset and outraged that how could she, cha you know, charge six police officers. But again and again, you know, it's been confirmed. You know, we had the Department of Justice report that came in. I said, you know, we, we need to reform the, the, the police department. We, ha we have a, a several sort of issues. And I could try this case 100 times and would end up with the same results without this reform. Um, you know, two weeks later, we had the Department of Justice report that came in. Then you had, you know, I said, you know, we, there are some issues within the police department that we have to address. We had seven federally indicted officers that came in and were pretty much going rogue and robbing, you know, drug dealers for their money. And then we had had after that, you know, administratively, I'm told that, you know, those six officers, all five of at least five of them were held administratively responsible. Mm -hmm. Two of them were suspended, three of them were fired, mm -hmm. and one nothing happened from, from my understanding. Again, this is from news reports because it was stated that he, he finally told the truth. So at the end of the day, it's about what's doing right, mm -hmm. and that's my job, that's my responsibility, and I'm going to continue to do that, regardless of, of, of whether it's popular or not. Right. So for full disclosure, I, I voted, I supported Maryland's campaign even as a Republican, but there were a lot of people within my party who uh, criticized you announcing the, the charges at the height of the unrest in Baltimore City, and they considered it to be highly political for you to do that, even though you single-handedly calmed the city. Would you do it again? I wouldn't do anything differently. I did my job. I mean, at the end of the day, I had more information. Y'all can clap on that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I had more information in that case than I do a lot of other cases. And we prosecute 50,000 cases a year in Baltimore City. You know, and I wouldn't do anything differently in that case. All five, five police officers spoke. So we were able to, you know, test and, and corroborate and, you know, investigate on our own based upon those, those kind of admissions. And so I, I'm, I'm okay. I, I can look at myself in the mirror and know that I fought in that case. Um, and without those reforms, again, that's something that we have to change systemically. Uh, final question I have for you. Uh, when you talk about what you're doing to reduce crime, you're making it clear we can't just keep locking folks up. Absolutely. I mean, when you look at Baltimore City, and Baltimore City is not, you know, any differently than any major urban city in, in, in the country. We have to systemically address these issues as to why crimes take place. You know, 24% of Baltimore's population lives in poverty, 35% of children live below poverty, and we look at these numbers, and we look at it as just numbers. Mm -hmm. 344 homicides, 314 homicides, we're now up to 182. It, these aren't just homicides. We have to look 
at what is happening in our communities. We have 18,000 vacant houses, 16,000 vacant lots. When you look at the, the African American population between 18 and 24, those young African American males, the, uh, the unemployment rate is more than twice that of whites. If we don't address these systemic issues, then we'll continue to see the surge in violence in our communities. I agree. Marilyn Mosby, glad to have you on the show. Thank you for having I me. I appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. Eight days on TV One. I will never lie to you. Oh my God. Roland Martin. He doesn't want to talk to us, he wants to ignore us. Uncensored. No. Hell no. no. That ain't gonna cut it, boo. Unapologetic. No, no, that, that is fundamentally false. You are wrong. Unfiltered. He wants an America where we all look alike. He ain't talking about black people. Unrelenting. You better go work out because you got to fight on your hands. News One Now with Roland Martin, weekdays at 7 a.m. on TV One.